Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Behavioral Corner. My name is Steve Martorano. This is where I hang. This is where I meet very interesting people who uh, always bring to the corner great stories that relate to what we talk about, which is behavioral health. And that's a huge topic. Covers, well, everything. That's what this podcast is about. Everything we do, everything we believe, the decisions we make, and how it affects our behavioral health. We're going to go back and touch on a topic we touch upon very often here on the Behavioral Corner because it's such a big problem, and that is trauma and the resulting post traumatic stress that often occurs as a result. We like to go back. It's worth talking about trauma a lot because it's a big problem, but we like to go back to it in particular as we go into November with, with, of course, the attended uh, uh, Veterans Day. Um, And, you know, the military is one of the places where you'll find a lot of trauma and certainly a lot of PTSD. Uh, It also occurs in other walks of life, of course, first responders and police are also victims of this inordinately, I might say. Uh, And we got a great guest for you because he touches both those bases. Uh, Our guest is uh, Matthew Marin. Matthew is both a a military veteran, a veteran of the United States Navy, and also a a career law enforcement officer uh, with the Houston Police Department, 14 years, highly decorated. Um, And uh, now he joins us as a uh, published author. We'll talk about his book, Silent Screens, uh, Screams, just ahead. And he is the national director of our great good friends, the Birdwell Foundation for PTSD. Matthew, thanks so much. Oh, thank you yeah. for having me, sir. Yeah, we, we, Matthew, uh, Matthew and I will give you a little behind the scenes. We've been struggling with technology here for a couple of minutes, <laughs> but we think we've got it squared away. Uh, anyway, Matt, let's begin with... Uh, with the Birdwell Foundation, because they're great, great friends of this program, uh, great supporters and great help. They, they, you know, you come to us through Roger uh, Marshall, who, uh, who's the head, head fella, uh, and uh, he's a great friend of the show. We wanted to thank him. But tell us how you got involved with Birdwell. Oh, for sure. And uh, Roger Marshall is also a, a very good mentor, and he, he has been to me uh, for leadership wise. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I've been helping out veterans and uh, first responders on my own time for, for years now. Um, we adopt families uh, of first responders that get injured on the job or, or veterans that, that get uh, injured and can't work, uh, uh, stuff like that. And um, uh, we usually adopt families like that for Christmas. And we try to, you know, do our own peer support, you know, brother to brother type stuff because um, uh, it's needed. And um, mm-hmm. uh, so I did that on my own time and uh, I've been through a lot of trauma myself and fought PTSD myself. Um, so I know how, how it is and how hard it can hit. Um, sorry, that's my baby in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So one day Mr. Birdwell himself uh, came to the Houston police department, the union and um, asked our board if they knew an officer who, who been through, been through a lot of trauma and uh, made it out the other end and is willing to help people get over their issues and, and fight their, their war within. And Mm -hmm. um, um, my name came up and, and I was offered a spot on the Burwell foundation and I jumped on it and uh, it's been great ever since. Yeah. Um, Check out, those of you who are interested in finding out more about, and they're a great organization, the Birdwell, uh, Birdwell Foundation. It's birdwellfoundation.org. Yes, sir. A lot, of good, a lot of good stuff there. So, Matt, uh, let's begin with uh, your experience with trauma. You, I guess you, you, you told me earlier you first experienced trauma uh, while in the military, while in the Navy. Is that right? Yes, sir. And uh, it, uh, it, it festered with you and stayed with you since you didn't identify it as a traumatic experience and followed you over into your career as a police officer. Uh, yeah. And then, and then things got, got worse there. Well, I, I knew it was a traumatic event in the military. Uh, it was a shipwreck and um, I was on the USS JFK and uh, it was an aircraft carrier. 
um, a fishing boat hit us and we killed everybody on the fishing boat. And I saw everything happen uh, right below me. Um, and it's kind of, kind of helpless. You can't do nothing about it. 98 feet in the air, you know, um, when did yeah, this happen? When did that? that happen? When did that happen? What, the, the shipwreck? Yeah. Uh, I want to say it was 2003, 2000, wow. 2003, 2004. Yeah. How old are you? How old are you at that point? Oh man, I, I was uh, 19. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, well, I was a baby. That, clear, clearly, <laughs> that's a, that's a traumatic event. Um, and then into law enforcement, you've had a distinguished career, but it has been uh, it's not been without some some problems, some difficulties. Uh, it, the police work is every day little events that by themselves don't look traumatic, but are. Uh, until they accumulate during this period of time when you were going through stuff like that and not identifying it as post-traumatic stress, were you uh, self-medicating? Yes. So first of all, I I didn't know what post-traumatic stress was. Right. I I never even heard of the term actually um, ever. (laughs) I I never even heard of, heard of that uh, at that point, but um, yes, I was self-medicating. I was, I was drinking a lot. Um, after my, my first shooting that I was in. Yeah. So you, you have more than once used your service, uh, weapon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Have you, have you, uh, have you ever killed anybody? Uh, yeah, a few. Yes, sir. A few, a few people. Yes, sir. Can, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. What does, what is it like to kill somebody? <laughs> um, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Yeah. Yeah. We often think of, uh, obviously the victim, uh, the, the person who's dead as being, as being the yeah. only kind of f- not fatality, but the only kind of victim of that event, but it can, it, it's, it's horrible, right? I mean, no matter what the situation you've just ended somebody's life. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. I don't, uh, we don't have to go. How many, how many police shootings have you been involved in? Um, I've been Im- involved in five, but I've actually shot my duty weapon twice. Okay. okay. Um, both times result in fatalities? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do, do, are you okay with those? I mean, do, is it in what way did your PTS, PTSD affect that act i mean that behavior you know what i mean were you under so much stress and trauma that maybe you used your gun too quickly or in the wrong circumstances or what no no um it's actually kind of weird i kind of explain it um but when i when i'm on the job like i i i I did my job really well on the street um Mm -hmm. I, i i believe i did and others did too um it, it's it's when I'm alone. That's when I, I start noticing my PTSD. Either that or um, sometimes uh, like if I see if I get called to a float a floater, which is a dead body in the water. Uh, mm. Sometimes sometimes I get flashbacks, you know, from the military side. Right. You know? um, uh, but uh, at first I didn't know how to uh, deal with it. And then after after training a lot of training and after a lot of therapy um, and speaking to my peers, venting, um, uh, keeping my mind busy, you know, you, you Mm. learn, you learn how to deal with these symptoms uh, to live a normal, healthy life. You know, you manage your your symptoms enough to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, first responders and even military guys are, are not aware that they're suffering from an actual thing. Right. And 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 uh, as you as you did self medicate, high incidence of alcoholism am- among those those two groups. Um, uh, when did you when did you uh, begin to be aware that this wasn't normal? Do, do you know what I mean? That that it wasn't normal to feel this way, and that you couldn't drink your way out of it. How did you get to that point? <clears throat> I had a couple of, couple of incidents 
uh, that kind of woke me up. But the main one that woke me up was um, after one of my shootings, I uh, I ended up killing the, uh, the suspect and um, I, I saved the, one of the women that were involved, a stab victim. And then I wasn't able to save uh, an older man who tried to intervene between the man and the woman. Mm -hmm. And the guy turned around and started stabbing the old man. And I, I actually shot and killed him while he was stabbing the old man. Uh, the neighbor that tried to intervene. Um, and the old man died in my arms, you know, asking for help after I, after I shot him, uh, I, I went up to him, kicked the knife away from the suspect, went, and, went to the old man and the older man and um, pretty much tried to set him up a little bit and try to see where his wounds were. And it was all in the stomach. So every time he was breathing, you know, you just kind of see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the guts coming out. So the, yeah, the damage yeah. was already done. Um, so, Afterwards, after that scene, um, I was at home by myself. I was single at the time and I was in an apartment and um, I started drinking, you know, and uh, I, the next thing I remember is I woke up with my gun in one hand and my glass of whiskey in the other. And I had no idea how I got my gun or when I mm -hmm. got my gun, you know, mm -hmm. so that 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 threw me in a spin. And uh, and uh, yeah, it made me start researching what I had. Yeah. Uh, what's the procedure after a police shooting like that in terms of uh, do you go do you work do you go to work the next day? Do they take no, your sir. gun away? For how, what's the procedure? No, sir. So um, so after a police shooting, we usually get three days off um, automatically. And that's to go get seen by the, the therapist and get evaluated. And if they think that you're not ready to go back on the street yet. Um, They'll, they'll hold you back for a longer period of time uh, before they throw you back on the street. Um, mm -hmm. But most of the time, you know, officers, they, they want to get back on the street. Like for, yeah. for me, for, for me personally, um, if I didn't go back on the street, I was going to be thinking about this stuff all the time, you know, and it was going to be flooding my mind the whole time I'm at home, not doing anything. You know? yeah. so, it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rock and a hard place for, for people in this business because on the one hand you you're you're you're, you're hurting you need you need to, to process what happened here uh but on the other hand um you know the you say it's a way to just you know get it out of my mind but right. but there's also this stigma attached to oh yeah man man yeah. up right uh, yeah so man. so when back when i did it um uh, it, you know, it's, it's been over 10, you know, it's been over around 10 years ago. Um, yeah, it, this PTSD wasn't a thing back then, you know, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't thought of like it is now, now, you know, your, your chain of command is aware of it now. Um, it's actually getting more and more accepted. Um, and so it, but there's still big stigma, like there people, officers, are very scared um, to come out and speak up that they have uh, PTSD because it puts a it puts a target on their back. You know, if it's basically you're a liability. Yeah, is this know? guy steady? Can I depend upon this guy? Is he going to hold right. up? Yeah, all, right. all that well, stuff. Well, well, that and and also your chain of command. You know, um, should I let this guy on the street? Yeah, you know that right. kind of thing. Right. But um, right. but the thing is, is that um, if you did that, if you took everybody away that had PTSD out in the street. You wouldn't have any good officers. Like mostly, most of your military guys that go and and uh, join police departments, they have PTSD, but they're trained and they know how to handle firearms and they know how to handle their stress. Um, and and now we're we're addressing the PTSD aspect of it to where they're managing their skills. You know, so I mean, uh, I don't see any issue with us being on the street. Yeah, we 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 have uh, come a long way at destigmatizing. Yes, a lot of mental health issues. And this one is, uh, you know, this one's particularly important because if you stigmatize a mental disorder in the military uh, rank and file or, or first responder, you're, you're going to get bad outcomes for everybody. You know, oh, yeah. you're going to have, you're going to get all kinds of people hurt if, if the folks aren't getting the treatment they need. So uh, uh, this, this essentially is the, is the, uh, 
subject matter of the book you wrote, Silent Screams, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, th these are stories that you've witnessed and experienced and what you've learned about treating uh, trauma? Yes, sir. So it's all stories that I experienced. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't tell anybody else's stories but my own. And um, it's all firsthand uh, yeah. experience. Yeah. And, yes, and uh, uh, Silent Screams, by the way, for those of you look, looking around, you know, it's on Amazon. Any place you can buy a book, you can find it. Silent Screams. L let me ask you now, because you, you have obviously uh, firsthand experience, but you've worked with lots of people now who suffer from trauma and post-traumatic stress. What are the some of the types of mental problems that that result from uh, from post-traumatic stress? Um, well, I mean, there's there's anxiety, um, paranoia. Uh, we have a lot of of officers that you know any any loud noise, we're you know looking around. Um, uh, there's there's a new. Everybody's different. It, it, it doesn't hit anybody the same. And then also, um, it doesn't like one person might get PTSD symptoms right after the incident and another person might not and get it three or four months down the road mm -hmm. and it, it'll blindside them, you know? Um, so it, it really, it really, it's, it, it depends on the person actually. Yeah. There, there are lots of behaviors, negative behaviors, I'm sure that are associated with trauma that at first glance don't look like they, they have anything at all to do with this. Oh yeah. Uh, for sure. I, I get, one, one of them is uh, one of them is lack of empathy. Right. Um, I know that for, for sure. I mean, um, and just that alone, will that, that along with a hot temper and a, sh and a short fuse um, that'll wreck marriages. It'll, it'll, it'll wreck families and re close relationships. And uh, that's what happened to me. So. Yeah. It, it, it also res results in, uh, uh, not only um, not only bad policing, but sometimes deadly policing. Uh, it's always occurred to me that whenever the latest you know police shooting causes justifiable outrage, that what we're looking at, in addition to you know whatever you may think of it, is is really uh, not great training and people yeah. on the street that need help. That you know. Because they're going to be a danger sooner or later. Does that explain some of what we've seen recently? Um, I don't know if I would say that PTSD caused them to to fire their weapon or to act aggressively, um, but I will say lack of training um, definitely. Uh, like I like I can speak for the HPD for Houston Police Department. We have tons and tons of training because we're a huge police department, and um, you rarely see that. Any anything like that with us um, mm -hmm. because of the amount of training we 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 do, um, and it comes second nature when we're actually in the field and going into a, a domestic violence call or or a, uh, a shooting in progress or whatever. Like it, it's second nature to how we react to these situations. Whereas mm -hmm. you get the smaller um, uh, police departments that don't have any funding or anything to get the the better training. Um, and yeah, you and you'll have some mishaps there. Yeah. Um, with regard to the military, you explained pretty clearly how it works for uh, police in your experience with regard to trauma. What, what uh, does the military do enough to take care of service people who are traumatized and have uh, post-traumatic stress? No, no, not at all. And then also whenever they get out, um, the VA is is like an assembly line. Um it's, it's very hard uh, for me. I know personally, when I got out, I tried to go to the VA and it literally took me three months to get an appointment to get seen. Um, and then on top of that, when I did get seen, um, I had to fill out tons and tons of paperwork. I basically stayed in it for like almost an hour doing paperwork. And then when I finally got seen, they, it was kind of felt rushed, you know, and all right, next type thing. And I just, it, it rubbed me the, uh, the wrong way. And that's why, um, that's a big reason why I, I saw what this foundation is doing. And it's given everybody a personalized experience to where we proactively seek out, seek them out and, and provide the peer support that they need for forever. Right. So if we know this, this guy, if we know John had a shooting 
uh, two years ago and I haven't heard from him in three months, I'm going to proactively check in on him and see where his mindset's at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anybody listening to this and watching you who uh, is struggling or have, you know, has problems, how, how does it work? Do they, they contact Birdwell and, and you guys do uh, a lot of different ways, sir. Um, so we do have a 24 seven hotline um, and that's nationwide on the, on it's on uh, birdwellfoundation.org. And then also we get a ton of referrals by um, uh, our, our, the guys that are on the foundation, their, their friends who are psychologists or therapists, or they work in mental health. We get a ton of referrals that way. And also we reach out to police departments, fire departments, et cetera. And we get referrals from them, them as well, because there's a lot of police departments that don't have their own personal uh, peer support unit. And matter of fact, uh, Houston Police Department, they literally, as big as they are, they just got their peer support unit established a few years ago. And um, and they're doing actually they're actually doing really great work. Um, and the and so the way we would come up, come to them is that, hey, um, if an officer comes to you and they don't and they don't really um, trust opening up to you, which a lot of officers don't because they're attached to the police department. But even though that they have uh, confidentiality that they have to abide by and they, ta- and they take that really seriously. And I, I, I really commend them for doing that so far. So good, you know, and um, but there's some officers that have that doubt in their head and they don't want to risk their career. So, yeah. you know, come to the Burwell Foundation and we'll take care of them and like like that, you know, yeah. and then also we're partnered with um, uh, rehab facilities as well. To where if let's say people are drinking too much, you know, we can get them detox and then get them into, into some therapy as well. Yeah, well, I know that that's how uh, that's the relationship that exists between Birdwell yes. and our, our partners, Retreat Behavioral Health. There's a lot of referrals going that way. And I know Retreat does a lot of work with uh, veterans. So, OK, right. so uh, the, uh, this program will post like the week before uh, Veterans Day, which is November the 11th. And we we know what to expect. There'll be speeches by politicians and there'll be bunting and some parades and yeah. a lot of that and a lot of thank you for your service um now i understand the motive behind that phrase thank you for your service but it's not enough is it um you know to be honest i i knew what i signed up for when i when i went um i my dad was in the marine corps my i have family met my grandpa was in the army it was an airborne, um, and, and it's just like I, I knew what I signed up for. So I'm not looking for a thank you. I'm not looking for anything. I just, I just want, I just want the government to understand that you know we went out there for for y'all and for our families. And when when we come back, we would like a little support. You know? mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We would like a little help. Um, Cause it's just like, you know, a uh, uh, workman's comp, like we got injured on the, on duty, you know, and we need sure. help, you know, so Matthew, I, uh, I Matthew, really you, 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 yeah, well, they, they're not understanding it fast enough. That's for sure. Yeah. By the way, before you go, do you ever see a, a movie or a television show that you thought accurately depicted what goes on in a police department? In a police department? You know, law and order, right? All that stuff. <laughs> do you ever see one where you went? That Law and order good. doesn't doesn't depict no that. doesn't do it does it <laughs> um I uh yeah actually um so there's a movie called uh, End of Watch and um that one's that one's pretty accurate oh I think I know that one is I think I saw that one yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know I often wonder what what like lawyers who look at lawyers shows think and what yeah cer- certainly there's a lot of cop shows anyway yours is not a show it's the real deal. Matthew uh, Marin's book is called Silent Screams. Yes, sir. Where, wherever you buy your books, Amazon is where I found it. So uh, you can find it there as well. He is the national director of the Birdwell Foundation for post-traumatic stress. We will have uh, links to that site and to their 24-7 phone number if you're in crisis and need some help. Hey, Matthew, uh, thanks for your service. Well, I appreciate you, sir. And um, I appreciate you having me on. And anybody who's listening, that's in the Texas area um, in March 26th of next year. Uh, we're having the Hometown Heroes event. 
And actually, um, y'all are a big sponsor for that mm-hmm. event. Yep. Um, and uh, and what that is is we are celebrating our he- our heroes in uniforms, our military and our first responders, and we're going to be raising money uh, for therapy for mil- uh, military and first responders, and also um, a local hero that's in need. Um, we're going to have car shows. We're going to have a live concert by Soldier Hard, who is a war veteran. And he does, he, he sings hip hop, but he is he sings about recovery and PTSD. And, um, we're going to have lots of raffles there and come out and support, support your heroes. Well, you know what? You'll, you'll, you'll be on, uh, with us sometime before that. So we can remind you. Oh, for sure. Matthew Marin, thanks so much for joining us on the behavioral corner. Thank you guys as well. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, like us there as well. We like to be liked. We don't like to be liked. Uh, and we will catch you next time hanging on the corner. At Retreat Behavioral Health, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 and begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.